the screen and then you can read. Well, we think ours might, might be probably easy. We just didn't know how to get to the end. We screwed up the, the landing. So one note here. Okay. And that go into draw mode. Turn this fella around. Yeah. Okay, so you're trying to integrate what? A uh, square root of one minus sine x dx. Square root of one. No denominator? No, no denominator. That's why I think it's probably really easy, but we still got stuck. <laughs> okay. Square root of one. Minus sine x dx, and then just dx. Okay, so what did you try? So we did u equals one minus sine x, which is essentially cosine x, but we kept as u equals one minus sine x. Just the no, here. one minus sine squared x is cosine squared x. Oh, really? I was like trying to find that online. I thought one minus sine x was also equal to cosine x, no? No. Okay, all right, well then I'm glad I didn't do that because my group thought I was wrong too. Um, all right, and then we have du equals minus cosine x dx. Okay. And then, so then we had u to the one half dx was essentially what we had for the integral at that point. And then we used the power rule. Okay, but you see here, dx is du divided by negative cosine of x. So if you're gonna do this, you have to turn this into a function of u. Oh, okay. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna show you two separate ways of doing this problem. Okay. Okay. All right. So, Method number one, it's equal to the integral of one minus sine x okay and I'm going to multiply the top and bottom by the conjugate looking thing. Okay, so that's just me multiplying by one. Okay, so now if I distribute this, it's going to be the integral, and then the top is going to be, when I multiply that out, it's going to be one minus sine squared x dx divided by the square root of one plus sine x. And then we use the identity that that's going to be the square root of cosine squared x dx divided by the square root. And I'm sure many of you see now how to do this problem, what's going to happen. Okay, now we want to say that cosine, the square root of cosine squared is just cosine. Okay, now since there are no bounds, we don't, we're just symbolically manipulating things. So that's going to be the integral of cosine x dx divided by the square root of one plus sine x. Now, if you let u equal one plus sine x, du is cosine x dx. And so this ends up being the integral of u to the negative one half du, which is going to be two square roots of u plus the constant c. Start with x, end with x. And there you go. Okay.
Any questions on how I did all that? No, I'm still catching up though. For uh, the step which is you, which you multiply the uh, like the one plus sign over one plus sign. Well, yeah, yeah, this one. Well, will the uh, multipl multiplication will cancel the square root? With no, because it's not the same quantity. The square root of A times the square root of B yeah. is the square root of A times B. The, the exponent rules work as well there, okay? Oh, okay, thank you, yeah. And what's the second method? That one was pretty easy. Okay, so method number two, it's gonna start with a different problem, but kind of similar to what we just did. Okay, so let's say we wanted to integrate um, one plus the cosine of x dx. Okay, well, I think that the cat's out of the bag, right? You would do exactly what I just did, okay? But remember that cosine squared of x has this identity, one half plus one half the cosine of two x. So that means that two cosine squared x's are gonna be one plus the cosine of two x. So that means two cosine squared of x over two is gonna be one plus the cosine of double that. So that means that this is gonna be the integral of two cosine squared of x over two dx. And so that's gonna be one over, I mean, radical two times um, the cosine of x over two dx. Notice that I haven't done any substituting or anything like that. I just used an identity, okay? So now this is gonna be radical two, the sine of x over two, divided by one half. So I guess I should write it like two radical two. Whoops. Plus a constant C, okay? All right, so this integral right here, that thing, um, there's a couple of different ways to do it. And when we get into the, um, the polar curves and we start computing arc lengths and stuff like that, we're gonna be dealing with these things the way that you see them, okay? Okay, so the original question, it was one minus sign, okay? So here's version number two on how to do this problem, okay? Um, we're integrating the square root of one minus the sine of x, right? Okay, now, if this is x and this is pi over two minus x, the sine of x is the same as the cosine of pi over two minus x. And since cosine is an even function, that's the same as x minus pi over two. We're gonna have some fun with, with these when we get to chapter 11, where we're gonna move things around. Okay, so dx is what this integral. Okay, so by using that one minus cosine of x minus pi over two dx, okay? 
And then you do maybe a U substitution or a variable substitution, you know, U is gonna be X minus pi over two. So DU is DX. And what we're left with is this guy, which up here, we just went through how to do it, okay? So once again, here's the identity. The cosine squared of X, I mean, whoops. The sine squared of X is one half minus one half the cosine of two X. So that means that two sine squareds of X over two is going to be one minus the cosine of, of U. These are all supposed to be U's. Okay. And so you would plug it in and get the integral. And then I've got a two. And then I have a sine squared of U over two du. And that's going to be radical two integral of the sine of u over two du. And that's gonna give me negative two radical two, the cosine of u over two, which is plus a constant c, okay? This is negative two radical two, the cosine of the U, which was, where did I, X minus pi over two plus a constant C. And I think when I finish this off, negative two radical two, times the sine of x plus a constant c. Now let's compare that answer with the one we got. So that's what we got. Two radical two, okay. Negative two radical two. Okay, so where's the mistake? This is a good problem. Well, the, the other one that you showed us that you were referring to was actually, sorry, that one was uh, one plus square root of one plus cosine X. And this one was square root of one minus sine X. Right, and so. So wouldn't the answers be different? Well, okay, so, so you're, here you're I am. Two to the square root of two sine x over two plus c. That's okay. if you had the square root of one plus cosine x. But okay, when... so here's here's where we started. Okay. Yeah. Okay, now this is where we ended up. Okay. Okay, so two radical one plus sine x plus c. Yeah, and we got a totally different answer for this the second time we did it. Two radical one minus sine x plus c. Okay, so let's see here, first of all, if I made any mistakes. All right. All right, so we'll do this thing again. I'm going to integrate. This time I'm going to do it faster, okay? One minus sine x, one plus sine x, one plus sine x, 
this ends up being the integral cosine x over the square root of one plus sine x dx u du two square roots of one plus sine x plus a constant c. Okay. So that's the same thing we got. Okay, now let's see what the hell's going on with this, if that's really correct. And we'll work this out. All right. So let's see. Again, we're going to go to the integral of the square root of 1 minus sine of x. Now I want to turn that into a cosine. Okay, so the sine of x is the same thing as the cosine of pi over two minus x dx. And then again with the u equaling pi over two minus x du is negative dx. Okay, so there's my first one. Lost that negative. Okay, so now we have negative integral one minus cosine of u du. And that we decided was equal to two sine squared of u over two du. Oh, I, I, I bet you I I forgot the u over two stuff. So this is going to equal negative radical two, and then the integral of the sine of u over two du, which is going to be, now the negative goes away. So it's going to be two, come on, pencil. It's going to be two radical two cosine of u over two plus a constant c. And so that's two radical two, the cosine of u, which was pi over two minus x. over two, right? And what did I do wrong the first and then the second time? Let's look back up here. I did sine, cosine. Yeah, see, I, I've screwed this up right here. I forgot the over two. Okay, so plus a constant C. So two radical two cosine of x over two minus pi over four plus a constant c. And if you compare that with the two radical one plus sine x, Both of these answers are correct. I don't, I don't think I made any mistakes. Okay, I know there's two ways to do this problem. Okay. Now, hopefully you guys kind of learned something there that it's kind of a luxury if you have two different ways to do it. Because you can do it one way and then go verify maybe the other way. Okay, any questions before we leave this one?
we're all good. Yeah, yeah, I liked the first example, method one, a lot better. <laughs> yeah, the reason that uh, the reason I bring up the second one is because in a few weeks you'll you'll when I show up with it you'll go oh yeah I remember that that what I'm going to do is I, I want to switch it the arguments to like see how I'm going from u to u over two you know so the kind of thing that we're going to have happen here is we might have an integral from zero to pi and then it's going to be the square root of cosine squared x dx but what you cannot do is now say that this is the integral from zero to pi of cosine x dx. The reason is because from zero to pi over two, cosine is positive. But when you go from pi over two to pi, it's a negative, okay? And so, but if we were to integrate zero to pi, the cosine squared of x over two square root. Now x over two is running from zero to pi. So, I mean, pi over two, where cosine is always positive, okay? And so that one will work out. Okay, we'll talk more about this when we get to it, all right? But I just want you to know that, you know, this technique is out there and that's kind of what, what I'm using it for. Here's my number 81. Okay. He wants us to integrate 2x squared plus 1e e to the x squared dx. Okay. And he tells a little story here. He says, e to the x squared doesn't have an antiderivative. We know that. 2x squared times e to the x squared. Um, x squared, e to the x squared, he's saying doesn't have an antiderivative. Okay. But he says that this guy does. All right. So I know the trick. We'll talk about it tomorrow. Uh, I want to give you guys a chance to, to get into it, okay? All right, so let's move on to some new stuff. 7.7, .7, and we are going to be approximating definite integrals. Okay, so a few of you have been me with me for a couple semesters. And if you haven't heard me say this before, e to the negative x squared dx has no elementary antiderivative. Okay, now finding areas underneath this curve is of massive importance. Notice that it's e to the something, so it's always going to be positive. If you were to graph this guy on an xy grid, it goes like this, and then it comes down like this, and what it is is the bell curve. Okay. For you guys that are moving into Math 280 in the fall, we will learn a sneaky dirty trick in figuring out how to get the total area, this infinite area underneath this curve. We'll be talking about uh, those integrals involving infinity. Those are called improper. Talking about those tomorrow and you may be a little bit today. Okay, and I think the area underneath this curve is the square root of pi, if I remember correctly. Okay, now this function, this 
what happens is it gets scaled a little bit where you put some number in front of this thing and then you put some other number up here where you know the m is positive and you scale it to where the area under the curve is equal to one okay and this curve has been deciding things for all of you guys your entire lives okay right when you came out of the womb uh, you had to get a vitamin k shot okay how much do you give an infant well if you give them this much it's not gonna do anything versus this much oh that's way too much you know so you know what's acceptable okay maybe in a better example would be like getting into college all right so let's let's say out of high school um you wanted to go to uc santa barbara or uc santa cruz or you know someplace occ cannot have been your dream right you know this is just you're going somewhere else after this place all right Okay, so you're applying for colleges and they want you to take the SAT test. Now that's being questioned right now. Um, they want your grade point average and there's other factors involved, you know. And so all of this kind of stuff goes into an equation. Um, maybe some schools like it if you were involved in student activities like sports or clubs, you might get points for that. Okay, so they, the people at UC Santa Barbara, they get all these applications and then they create a number for everybody, which might be your SAT score and then something with the grade point average or blah, blah, blah. Okay, and let's say that the average is mu and it falls right there. Okay, now it's been shown by Gauss, by the central limit theorem, and some of you guys that take mathematical statistics, so that'll be Eduardo, uh, perhaps Brian, um, it's, it's the real statistics. But this is all the Math 160 stuff here, it's just we can't do any calculus in Math 160. It's been shown that the distribution of all of these scores will always follow the bell curve, okay, like so, all right. Now remember that they scale everything. How did it do that? Just made a straight line out of nowhere. That was an interesting trick. How did that work? Try that again. Um, okay, and so, I don't know, let's say the, the average score for everyone after everything is considered is a thousand okay so if they're going to only if they're going to admit the top 10 percent of students they find a place right here let's call it um um i don't want to call it let's see what well it's this cutoff value let's let's use uh lambda for it and if they're gonna admit the top 10 percent of students then the area over here is going to be 0.1 okay and so if your score where you did your sat your grade point average any clubs you were in if you fall anywhere in this region you're going to get accepted anywhere else well maybe how about orange coast college okay and so figuring out areas underneath this curve, this particular guy right here is of paramount importance to, to all of us, okay? But like I said, can't be done directly. It can only be approximated. Chapter 11, we'll learn a way of approximating some of these guys. Okay, so let's, let's go back to the beginnings of integrals. Recall, that if we have this function f of x 
continuous on the interval a b we had this left hand endpoint approximation one up to n of the integral and it's going to be x i minus one delta x where you know we've done all this usual crap partition a b into a equaling x zero less than x one da, 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 less than x n equaling b and if you guys remember uh last semester in 180 you know this is we directly got um the integral of x squared to be one third by using the partitions and then using the squeeze theorem okay so the left hand endpoint does that the right hand endpoint looks like this okay so both of these things are going to approximate what's going on with the curve so let me draw a little picture here so we'll go like this and then let's say this is what the curve is looking like and these are some of our partition points okay so with the left hand rent endpoint i'm going to use red okay now i'm going to use red for right hand endpoint okay so we would do this this and this and then we would do this this and there that that and that so this is using the left hand endpoint you guys still with me yes okay now what if i was going to use the right hand endpoint well what do you say we do that in blue um like there and the left hand endpoint we would come up oh shit had it on a race. It went, and then I did that, right? Okay. So using the, the left-hand endpoint, we would be doing this up, over, and down. Then this one, we would go up, over, and down. And then this one, we would go up, over, and down. Okay, so it kind of looks like the red is over and down, okay? It looks like the red is undershooting it, doesn't it? And it looks like the blue are, is maybe, depending on how close these regions are, this one and this one, maybe overshooting it or undershooting. Okay, but is there in general, is there any reason to suspect that one of these two approximations might be better? I don't think so. One thing that we could do is we could maybe pay for some more accuracy if we were to let x bar, x i bar be the midpoint xi minus one plus xi over two, then we might have this midpoint approximation, which is going to be the sum i equaling one up to n f of xi bar delta x. If I do the midpoint in black, it would look like this. So we will get here and it will go over and down. Let me erase the middle. Okay, back to blank. And then this midpoint looks like it's going to be here. And so now the picture is really getting bad. Okay, I, I promise I'll stop. Okay, and then here, you know, we get this guy. Okay, now, like I said, there really is no reason to suspect that the left-hand endpoint is any better than the right-hand endpoint. And 
sometimes the left-hand endpoint will always overshoot and the other one will undershoot, kind of like it did with X squared. But in general, we don't really, we really can't say one way or the other. However, the midpoint rule, this should be better. Now, the reason that it should be better is because we paid for it. All right. All right. So we're going to approximate an integral that we already know the answer to just to see how close we get. Okay, so let's pretend that we don't know or we don't have a calculator and we don't have an antiderivative of this. And so we're going to approximate it. Okay. Now remember that it's equal to the natural log of two. Okay, now I'm going to pull that big ass number out on my phone. I'm going to try to keep it on my phone. So, because we're going to keep referring to it, you might want to do the same. All right, so get two, hit the natural log, and it's 0 0 0.693147180559. Four or five, and that's where my calculator runs out of decimals. Okay. All right. So what we'll do here is we will partition the interval one to two into, let's say, n equals ten, equal width subintervals. Okay. So our partition point is going to be one. Um, so one, which is going to be this, the starting point. Okay. Now the width is going to be one tenth. Okay, so here, let's, let's start it like this. It's going to be 10 over 10, and then we'll go to 11 over 10, 12 over 10, 13 over 10, all the way up to 19 over 10, and then 20 over 10. And this is 1, and this is 2. Okay, so when I do the left-hand endpoint, L10, okay, it's going to be the following sum. I'm going to flip over all of the left-hand endpoints, okay? So it's going to be this sum, 10 over 10 plus 10 over 11 plus 10 over 12, plus 10 over 19, plus 10 over 20. Then we have to multiply by the delta x, which is the 1 tenth. Okay, so this is delta x, and all of these are feeding the numbers into the function f of x is 1 over x. So it's flipping all those fractions around. So the 10 cancels. So what we get is the sum of these reciprocals. And oh wait, it only goes up to 19 because we're using the left-hand endpoint. So 10 over what, 1 over 19. On there. 1 over 19. Okay, so let me bang this out on my calculator and see what I get. 1 over 10 plus 1 over 11, 12 over 13, 1 over 14, over 15 plus 1 over 16 plus 1 over 17, 
plus 1 over 18 plus 1 over 19 equals. And what I get for L10 is 0 0.7187714, and it keeps going. Okay. Now, R10, this is going to be easy for me to do because it's all the same stuff, but what we would do is we were going to flip up, flip over all the other guys. And so this is going to be 1 over 11 plus 1 over 12, all the way to 1 over 19. And now we do have to use the last one. OK? So if I subtract my 0.1, 1 over 10, from what I got, and then if I add 1 over 20, I'm going to get R10 equaling 0 0.66877 something like that. Okay, let me let me do that one again real fast. So Yep, get same thing. So I'm pretty confident. Okay, so let's see here. Here's here are these numbers, and remember, the natural log of two is um, zero point six nine three one four seven whatever. Okay, so let's see which guy is actually closer. All right, and by how much? So if we check on our calculator, and if I take I take the R10 number, which is going to be, I do that again. I want to get it exact. Okay, one over eleven. Plus one over 18, one over 19, plus one over 20. Okay, and I'm, now I'm going to subtract off the natural log of two. And so the magnitude of R10 minus the calculator's natural log of two is roughly about 0 0.02 four, three, seven. Okay, now let's compare the L10 number. Okay, so what I'll do is I'll add the natural log of two back. Okay, and then I'm gonna subtract off one over 20. I'll add back on one over 10. Okay, so there's that number. Then I subtract the natural log of two from it, the error in approximation to five, six, two, four. So you see it's it's about the same, right? Okay. And as expected, like there there are some situations where you could stare at it and physically say, okay, I know for a fact that this is better than that. So I'll use this. Okay, now let's try the midpoint and see what happens. Okay, so the midpoints, so here was 10 out of 10, here was 11 out of 10, okay? So instead of calling it 10 out of 10, maybe it would be easier to call it um, 20 
one is equal to 20 over 20. Okay, now, and the next one would be 22 over 20, right? And so the midpoint right here is going to be 21 over 20. The next midpoint is going to be 23 over 20, you know, and 25 over 20. And this is going to go all the way to the end where the last guy is 2, so it's 40 over 20. So this guy is going to be 39 over 20. Okay. Now, again, when we feed it into the function, the sum i equaling 1 to 10 of f of xi bar delta x, okay, it's going to be all of these numbers flipped over 10, I mean, 10 over 21 plus, I mean, 20, 20 over 21 plus 20 over 23, 20 over 25, all the way till we get to the end, 20 over 39. And then we have to multiply by the delta x, which is a 110. 1 over 10. Okay, so we're going to get a 2 times 1 over 21, 1 over 23, all the way up to um, uh, 1 over 39. All right, so this is going to give me a minute, take me a minute to calculate. So stand by there. Maybe you guys can do it too over 21 plus one over 31 plus one over 33 plus one over 35 plus one over 37 plus one over 39 equals times two. And what we get is M10 is 0 0.69283560040 and blah, blah, blah. If we were to compute the error here, M10 minus the natural log of two in magnitude, look at this. We're going to get 0 0.000. .000 three one okay so we have decimal accuracy up to three decimal places okay as opposed to up here it looks like we only have one decimal place of accuracy okay now the reason that it got closer is because we paid for it okay so let's in in approximating and stuff like that payment is comes from um, the number of calculations that you're going to do okay so for l10 let's count and see how many things we needed to do okay so we we um you know what's it called um Partition, that's the word I'm looking for. Okay, so we partitioned the interval one into n equals subintervals. Okay, so that was one calculation that we did. Okay, and then we had to feed all of these numbers into the function. Okay, well, there's, there's 10 of them, right? So one plus 10, okay. And then we had to add these 10 numbers together. Okay. So that's nine additions, right? All right. And then we had to um, recognize that the 10 canceled with the 10 upstairs. 
So that's another one. So it looks like for this problem, it took 21 things, okay? Depending on how you're counting. As for this fella, okay, let's see. We partition the interval just like we did before, okay? But now we had to find the midpoint, okay? Now, remember, what we're doing is we're telling a device to do this or a software package, something, okay? So they're going to have to feed those things in. The device is going to flip over. It's going to have to figure out all of these midpoints. So now there's an additional 10 that we have to do. Okay, and then we have to do the um, 10, feed the number into the function, okay, and then we had to add them all together, okay, so that was a 9, and then we had to multiply everything by, what was it, 2, okay, so 20, so 31, as opposed to where up here did I say 21? Okay, now out in industry, the way this works is you don't use 10 partition widths. I mean, we're talking about you need areas under curves, you know, and even if you're just manufacturing nuts and bolts, you know, the tolerance needs to be, you know, you know in a certain range or, or else the thing's not going to work. Okay, so accuracy is what you want. If it was medicine for babies or something like that, you wouldn't want 10 partition points. You'd probably want a million, okay? And then you're just gonna have your, your device do it. Okay, so I still have an old Texas Instruments calculator and it's in my office and it will numerically integrate things. I don't know exactly what um, procedure it's using. <laughs> but it's pretty accurate, okay? So I think what we've seen here is that the midpoint rule is gonna be superior, right? All right, so, but you're gonna pay for it. We're paying for it with 31 additional things, okay? Now think of it like this. That was that 10 that came from calculating the midpoints. If that was a million, and that's a million more calculations, Back when I was in college, before all this cloud computing and all this stuff, there was only so many supercomputers that the US government had access to. And NSA and NASA and JPL and uh, CIA, everybody's wanting access to these things, okay? And so guys like me were like hired to, maybe you can trick the system a little bit and maybe it'll give us a better number for, uh, you know, for less, less of a cost. Okay, well, let's, let's try to get clever here. Okay, suppose that we were working on this problem and, you know, we were either gonna be, you know, we're gonna be partitioning up the points here. Okay, and so maybe, let me draw one that's more curved. Okay. So a guy that goes like this, let's say, okay? So here's gonna be where our, my partition points are. And okay, up on the curve, here are where these things touch, okay? And I was to I'm really struggling with this pencil thing today. Hold on a second. Okay, so maybe that'll work. So here's where we are on the curve. Okay, so instead of approximating the area of the curve with these clumsy rectangles, um, maybe 
we should approximate it with things that are a little more close to the curve. Like for example, if, what if we were to do something like this and then go like that, okay. Kind of looks like I've got Parkinson's disease. And then we go like this and then that goes down, okay. So what these things are, if you look at them from the side, okay, it looks like I've got these kind of shapes that go like this, 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 and this. This is what we call a trapezoid. Okay. Now there's a formula for the area of a trapezoid. Let's just draw a you know, general trapezoid there. Okay, so if this is like the base number one, and that's the base number two, and its height is from here to here, I believe the area of a trapezoid is B1, the average of these two things times the height, okay? And so if we apply that to our picture, let's see here, I'll do this again. So like this and like that. Okay, so let's say that this is x0, that's x1, x2, x3. That should be enough, okay? So I've got something going like this. And so, This point right here is x0, f of x0. Remember, we know f. This point right here is x1, f of x1. This width right here is delta x, okay? So if you take that trapezoid and lay it on its side like this, okay? then the length from here to here is going to be f of x1. The length from here to here is going to be f of x0, and this is going to be delta x, okay? So our, our what we'll call the trapezoid approximation, okay, is going to be the area of each one of these trapezoids, okay, so the first one is going to be f of x0 plus f of x1 over 2, then times the delta x, and then the next one is going to go f of x1 plus f of x2 all over 2, and this is gonna go until we're all the way to the end. F of x n minus one plus F of x sub n all over two. And then all of this is gonna get multiplied by delta x. Okay, so we bring the two out. And what we're seeing here is I'm getting f of x zero, and then I'm gonna get two f of x ones, two f of x twos. And this is gonna continue forever until we get to the second to last step, two f of, sorry about that, plus um, two, f of x of n minus one, and then we just have this last f of x n, okay? And if we write it a slightly different way here, 
it would be f of x zero two times this f of x one plus f of x n minus one plus f of x n. Okay, now before we go and experiment with this, let's count how many additional calculations we are actually going to do here. Okay, you ready? First of all, we were going to partition up the thing anyway, right? Okay, so that doesn't count. Um, we were, let's say we were using the left hand approximation, okay? we would have had to have computed all of these numbers already, okay? But the, but the only thing different here is now I'm gonna take this collection of them and after I add them, which I was already going to, right? I'm then gonna multiply by two. So that's one additional calculation, okay? I was always gonna multiply by delta X. Now I gotta divide delta X by two. So we get, only two additional computations. That's pretty good. Only two additional computations, okay? Now, if the, if N was equal to a million, it's still only two additional computations. Okay, so let's see what T10 looks like for our integral. Okay, so it's gonna be the delta X, which was one over 10 divided by two. Okay, then it was gonna be 10 over 10 plus two times, okay, now here we go. It, the next partition point is 11 over 10. So one over that, remember f of x is one over x, is gonna be 10 over 11, 10 over 12, until we get to the last guy, 10 over 19 plus 10 over 20, okay? And let's see here. Uh, I can cancel the, the, the 10 stuff, right? So this is gonna be one half times one over 10 plus two over 11, two over 12, two over 19 plus one over 20. Okay, so let's run this through the ringer and see what happens. So clear this out. One over 10 plus two over 11 plus two over 12 plus two over 13 plus two over 14 plus two over 15 plus two over 16 plus two over 17 plus two over 18 plus two over 19 plus one over 20 equals, okay, and I did something wrong. Okay, so it's delta X over two and then it's the 10 over 10. Okay, so 10 was gone, the half is there, so I made a mistake in that. So let me do this again, right? One over 10.
Oh, wait a second. Time out. Am I doing the midpoint? What am I doing here? So I've got 10 partition points, right? So yeah, that's that that's 10. Yeah, that's right. Okay, I'm, I'll just psych myself out there for a second. All right, start this over again. All right, so I'm going to get one over ten plus two over one. Fourteen plus two over fifteen plus sixteen plus two over seventeen plus two over eighteen plus two over nineteen plus one over twenty. There. Now multiply that by a half. And what we get for this remarkable only two additional computations that the device is going to do. Six nine three seven seven one four zero three da da da, and if I take t ten, and if I was to subtract off the log, and subtract off the log of two. Look at this. I get really good accuracy, almost as good as the midpoint. You know, look, where was the midpoint? The midpoint was zero, 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 three. I think, yeah, look at that, three. And so we are about, the midpoint is about uh, twice as good as ours because its error is about half as, as much, okay? All right, so this is pretty cool that by just you know using a little bit of our brains here you trick the system all right so the archaic way you know like uh, so i've got like a math 30 class right now i don't know if i'm going to be asking this but when i do math 30 or like college algebra i'll have problems where i'll put on the test you guys might remember some of you guys from pre-calculus like i had a problem 1,501 plus 1,502. You remember doing something like that? That was, that was the first uh, test you gave this to us, I want to say, in pre-calc. Yeah. And it's just yeah, divided yeah. by two, It's right? It's like, or yeah. all those, yeah, I think it's all those. Over two. Yeah. yeah, so there's a, there's a formula that you use. But when I was, the, when I was walking around the room in like the college algebra class while they were doing their part one of the test, some guys actually there with his calculator going 1501 plus 1502 plus 1503. You know, that's not the point of the problem, you know. So, you know, Gauss came up, you know, with this idea that if you just add this up to n, it's n times n plus one over two. So you use that result manipulated you know to figure out what this guy needed to do okay all right so this is pretty good only two additional computations and we were able to get that okay so before we move any further here there's some uh there's some uh facts and slash results okay so number one, as n increases, oops, as n increases, ln, mn, I mean, rn, mn, and tn all get better you know and that's like okay no shit you know of course i mean you're paying for more right remember payment cost comes in the form of 
of computations. So if you're paying more, you're going to do a little bit better. Okay. Now, one of the, one of the results um, is that number two, the error in using MN will have the opposite sign if you used TN. Okay, so in words, here's what this is saying. That if MN is undershooting it, TN will overshoot it. Okay, and vice versa. Now, again, you know, we, we need to get into some stuff. Um, for you guys that are engineering majors, you're going to have to take a, a class, maybe even two, in numerical stuff. And uh, when you do that, um, you, you generally have a choice. You could take it in your department or you can take it with the math department. You always take it with the math department. You'll get credit. And the reason is because it's so damn easy. Okay. My friend, I've told you this, my friends and I, we would have contests to see who could be the least prepared for the exam. And, you know, drinking a case of beer and watching all three Star Wars, you know, that, that wasn't very creative. The winner was Tim, Tim Shemp. Uh, the day before the exam, it just so happened to be his birthday. And so he and my buddy, our buddy, John Jasminsek, who's now a physics professor at SLO, they, do they drove around to 43 Denny's in the Pomona slash Covina area and got the free meal that you get on your birthday. And we all put like 10 bucks in a jar and Tim clearly won. But anyways, so we will be able to explain this stuff when we get into the numerical stuff, okay? So if we call error T the error from using the trapezoid rule and we call EM the error from using the midpoint rule, what we find is that EM is in magnitude roughly half that of the error due to the trapezoid rule. And I, I can vaguely remember going through this in Professor Chabelle's class. Okay, now, as far as this goes, we're not going to be able to prove this, but this is a huge result for us. Okay, so suppose that our function f of x has a bounded second derivative, okay? for all x sitting in this interval a, b, okay? Then number one, the error due to the trapezoid rule cannot exceed this bound k times b minus a cubed over 12, and squared. And the error due to the midpoint rule can be no bigger than this k, b minus a cubed divided by 24 n squared. Okay, so the proofs of this, um, probably when you're seniors. Um, Eduardo, you're going to have to take that class as a math major. 
But the rest of you guys, you know, if, if that's uh, an option, I'm telling you, because all the engineering, a bunch of my engineering major friends, they figured this out and they're all in there with us because in the engineering department, they're actually having to go compute shit. Okay. We're just showing this kind of stuff. Look, it works, you know? So anyway, that's for that. Okay. So let's, let's look at our trapezoid rule and our midpoint rule and see what happened. Okay, so our function is one over X. And it's on the interval one to two. Okay, so F prime of X is negative one over X squared. And F double prime of X is two over X cubed. Okay, now, Figuring out how to bound functions is where you really earn your money, okay? This one is gonna be real easy, okay? The biggest that this could possibly be is two, right? Okay, so for the, the trapezoid rule, the error from the trapezoid rule can be no bigger than two times B minus A divided by 12 times 10 squared. Okay, so that's gonna be the error of the trapezoid rule. It's gonna be 100, it's gonna be less than or equal to one over 600. And one over 600, when I put these on exams, I make easy numbers for you. So it's, you know, uh, Let's see, one over 600, point zero zero one, which is roughly, okay, now if you look back up to where we computed this stuff, look at that, three zeros and then the six, okay? Right here, it's only two zeros. Okay, so according to this, it actually worked. All right, now let's, let's see, for this problem, for example, maybe we can find an N such that TN minus the natural log of two would be less than 0 0.001. Let's see how many terms we would have to have to go out in order to get this. Okay, so according to the result that's back up here of pi, okay, that E sub T is no bigger than two over 12 N squared, which is equal to one over six N squared. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna set one over six N squared to be less than 0 0.0 zero one. So that means when you flip that over that six n squared has to be bigger than 10, a hundred, a thousand. So n squared has to be bigger than a thousand divided by six, 166.6 6. Take the square root of that guy, square root, and n needs to, did I do that right? Two, 24 n squared. It says n bigger than 12.90. Okay, so pick n equal 13. It's kind of, is the n squared being greater than 166.66 or is it supposed to be 666.66? Um, I just can't see what the first digit is supposed to be. It's so 166. it's 166, right? Yeah. Okay, cool. Gotcha. Yeah, so 6n squared is bigger than 1,000. So 1,000 divided by 6 is that number. And then you take the square root of it, and I got a 
12.9, so pick n equal 13. Okay. Now, what that is doing is guaranteeing that it's going to work. Okay. Notice that in our problem, we only had to pick 10 and we got it to that. Okay. Now, I would imagine the curious of you would be wondering, you know, like, well, how do you know this? Like, like if let's say let's let's say your boss says to you, okay, go figure out a way to compute this number. And you say, okay, well, I can't compute it directly, but this is an approximation of it. And I can make this approximation as close to the number you're looking for as I want. Your boss might sit there scratching their heads going, how do you know that? If you don't even know the number, how do you know what to subtract your approximation from to prove to me that your approximation is indeed that accurate? And again, this is the power of mathematics. We don't need to know the number in order to get it to work. Okay, another clever one that is in this chapter is called Simpson's rule. Obviously named after some character named Simpson. Homer Simpson. Homer Simpson. <laughs> named after him. Yep. Okay, so what Simpson wanted to do was maybe take advantage of some curviness. So let's say that this is the curve, okay? And we want to maybe approximate the area under the curve. So we'll start with these some partition points, like here's one here, and maybe here's another one here, and maybe here's one here, and then here's one here, and maybe here's one here, okay? All right, now, instead of using trapezoids, what Simpson wanted to do was use parabolas, okay? So we have three points here, okay? And between any three points, you can draw one and only one parabola. So I'll try to give it a shot here. Where I'm gonna go through all those points, okay? And then with the next lumping of them, I'm gonna try to draw another parabola. Okay, and so if you're going to do this, you're going to have to have three points in order to do that, which corresponds to two subintervals. Okay, so when using Simpson's rule, this n must be even. Okay. All right, so here's how this uh, story goes, all right? Let's, let's say that this approximating parabola, instead, let's write it like where it's kind of centered, okay? So his zero, let's say that this is an H. It's always traditional with Simpson's rule to use h because I guess he did. So delta x is now equal to h, okay? And let's say that this is the point uh, p sub zero. What happened there? p sub zero. And let's say that this is the point p sub one. And let's say this is the point p sub two. Okay, and we know the coordinates of this point. What we'll say, we'll call, we'll let yi equal f of xi, okay? So this coordinate is gonna be negative h comma y zero. This coordinate is going to be zero comma y one. And this guy is going to be h comma y two. Okay. Now, like I said, there's only one parabola that we can that we can draw in here. Okay, between these three points. 
okay? The function might be doing something different between these guys, you know? He might be going like this. Well, it wouldn't, it wouldn't have turned back like that, but you know what I mean? Okay, so here we've got these three points. All right, now this parabola, we haven't figured it out yet. So it's some ax squared plus bx plus c. Okay, now again, I'm gonna ask you a question. Can we find the equation of this parabola if we're given these three points? What's the answer? Yes. Yes. Okay. Now, do we need to? We don't know just yet. Okay. Remember, we're in the business of trying to cut down on calculations. Okay. So the approximating area, the approximating area, under this parabola, which we don't know the equation of, it's gonna go from negative h to h of ax squared plus bx plus c dx. Okay, so if we integrate this real quick, what we're gonna get is a x cubed over three, plus b x squared over two plus c x evaluated at negative h and h. And what we find is that we're gonna get a two a h cubed over three plus um, this, this piece wipes out because it was an odd function on a symmetric interval. And this is gonna be two C H, okay? All right, and let's see here. Maybe if I uh, do a little factoring here, how about I factor H over three out of this guy? So if I factor H over three out, what we're left is, 2a h squared plus 6c, okay? So whatever the approximating parabola is that we decide is gonna approximate that particular area, this is what it would be. Okay, now we're gonna use the fact that y zero is on the parabola, okay? So y0 is equal to a times h squared minus bh plus c. Okay, because remember, it came from the point negative that guy and f of negative that guy, f being the, the guy. Y1 is going to be just this C, and Y2 is the A H squared plus B H plus C. Okay, now remember, what we're after here are is a, an approximation of the area based on information from the function. Notice that if I was to take y0 plus y2, I would end up with 2a h squared plus 2c, which is almost what I need, okay? And so 2a h squared plus 6c, that's gonna be y zero. Now look, I need four more of them. So I need four y ones, and then I'm gonna have the y two, okay? And so our first approximation of the area 
is going to be this h over 3 number times y0 plus 4y1 plus y2. Okay? And then we will move to the next parabola. And the next parabola, we would start with the y2. So we'd have the y2 and then 4y3s and then the y4. And this will continue until we get to the very end. H over 3, y sub n minus 2, 4y sub n minus 1, plus y sub n. So when you clean all that up, what we get for Simpson's rule, come on, right. This thing sucks. Simpson's rule is given by this, h over 3, and then it's y1 plus y0 plus 4y1, 2y2, 4y3, 2y4. And then the last one is going to be plus 2yn minus 2 plus 4yn minus 1 plus yn. And this is so-called Simpson's rule. Okay, so notice how the pattern goes. It goes 2, 4, 2, 4, 2, 4. All right, so let's see if I can uh, do some stuff here. If we were going to be programming this into the device, we would have h over 3, and then I would have this y0, and then I would take all of the 4s, and then all the twos, which occur with all the evens, plus y n minus two, and then the y n. Okay, now again, let's count up calculations. So we're adding all of the numbers up again. So there's one additional calculation because if we're using left-hand endpoint, we wouldn't add that number. We're dividing delta x by 3. There's another calculation for us. Okay. All of these numbers we were going to add up anyway, right? So we just we just enter enter the thing and have the device program in such a way to multiply all these odd guys after you add them up by 4 and then end multiply by 2. So there you have it. Only four additional computations. Okay. Now with Simpson's rule, let's let's use S10 for the natural log of two. Okay. So S sub 10, it's going to be one over 30. Okay, and then it's y0, which is going to be a one plus. Now this is going to be 40, remember the partition goes to 11, and then 20 over 12, 40 over 13, 20 over 14, um, 40 over 15, 20 over 16, 40 over 17, 20 over 18, 40 over 19, and then plus one half, one, one over two. Okay, so let's see. I guess I can write this as 10 over 10. And I can write this as 10 over 20. And I can you know, just sign up and do it. Okay, so right there we go. So let's see how close this guy gets. So I'm going to get a clear everything. One 
plus 40 over 11 plus 20 over 12 plus 40 over 13 plus 20 over 14 plus 40 over 15 plus 20 over 16 plus 40 over 17 plus 20 over 18 plus 40 over 19 plus 0.5. Divide this by 30 and what I get for S10 is approximately 0 0.69 three one five zero two three zero zero stuff like that and again if i do the s10 minus the natural log of two in magnitude this is startling zero 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 three we picked up five decimal places of accuracy by only doing four or depending on how you think of it, maybe even three additional computations. Okay. The final thing we'll say about this is the bounding area error. Error. Okay, so the error due to Simpson's rule in magnitude um, is going to be, it, it's going to be the, why does it always default to eraser? Um, it's, it's either going to be S10 minus the integral. or the reverse, okay? Now here's the result for Simpson. Simpson's rule is a little more strict, okay? So if the function's fourth derivative is bounded, how about let's, let me just so you see what I'm writing. If one, two, three, four is bounded by K, then the error to Simpson's rule cannot exceed K B minus A to the fifth power, okay, divided by this 180 N to the fourth. All right, now what makes a fraction smaller is making the denominator bigger. Remember the trapezoid had a 12 in the denominator, midpoint had a 24, okay? Uh, this is a 180, okay, but that's not the big part. The big part is the n to the fourth, all right? All right, so let's see on our example for f of x, how far we would have to go one over x, so f prime is negative one over x squared. Double prime is two over x cubed. Triple prime is negative six over x to the fourth. Fourth derivative is equal to 24 over x to the fifth. And on the interval one to two, the biggest that this thing can possibly be is going to be 24. So that means that the error due to the Simpson's rule is going to be less than or equal to 24 over 180 and to the fourth. Okay, so let's see find n such that es is less than, what did I have before? Two decimal places of accuracy. So you just set um, 
24 over 180 n to the fourth to be less than 0, 0, 001. So that means that 180 n to the fourth over 24 has to be bigger than 1,000. Okay, so now I'll start doing this on my device. Let's see, I take 1,000, divide by 180, multiply by 24, and I got n to the fourth being bigger than 133, whatever, okay? Now I need to take the fourth root, so I need to raise that to the 0.25 power. And what I get is that n has to be bigger than 3.3. Okay, so n equals four works here. Okay, I don't know if I'd buy that. So let's let's do it directly and see. Four sub intervals. Okay. So here we go. One and two. So here are four sub intervals. This is occurring at four over four, five over four, six over four, seven over four, and this is eight over four. Okay. So our H here is one fourth. S4 is one third of H, so that's going to be one over 12 times the first guy plus four times the flip over the second guy plus two flip over this guy plus four flip over this guy and then just flip over the last guy. And let's see what that gives us. So clear, one plus 16 over five plus eight over six plus 16 over seven plus a half equals, divide this by 12 and what we get is this is almost equal to six, nine, three, two, five, three, nine, yada, yada, yada. And if I do S4 minus the log of two, what I get is almost zero, 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 one, zero, six. And notice that that is far less than 0 0.01 as, or 0, 0, 001, just as we thought. So using Simpson's rule, we only have to do four computations, okay, to get that. Now, the beauty of Simpson's rule is to get this level of accuracy does not require us to do a whole boatload more of computations. We just kind of finish it off like that. Okay. Stop podcast here. Go back to class. See how many people, 51 made it today. All right. I'm about to explode here. So we say we take a break and then I'll come back and we can wrap it up. All right. All right. Do we have more class, Bobby? Not today. I'm just going to tell you what problems to do and you know what to think about. It's just I, I haven't. Okay. Yeah, no worries. I drink. I've been drinking a lot of water today. Oh, no worries, man. Yeah, I'll talk to you soon. Did anyone else feel like super confused by what we just did? Yeah. For sure. I'm, I'm like completely just the. I today I feel like I zoned out for one second when he started going over like the theoretical stuff and I came back in mind wise 10 minutes later and I'm like what is what is any of like well what what does it mean <laughs> <It's> life 
Well, what am I doing here in this chair? My hair explains it all, man. Check, <laughs> out. Check that out. Uh, oh, I, I, I followed through and I saw you guys messing around with that problem when I first yeah. log, logged in. I was like, why are you? Oh, I afraid it froze. Eduardo, you froze, uh, I assume. My internet didn't, didn't crash on me. Yeah, man, you were telling us something about the problems that you're working on, and then uh, you just. Well, yeah, I was like, he, I'm like, when I saw that you guys were doing it the long way, I'm like, why didn't you just guys turn it into a cosine? Oh, yeah, I was, I don't know, man, I, I he, feel he, lost. He screwed up, at, like, yeah. halfway through the floor, I had, like, a brain fart, and I'm like, well, he's going to. I see what he's doing, and I'm like, I'm gonna go pee while he tries to finish it up. But he's gonna redo the thing and then go and explain that he forgot the one over two. Yeah, man. It. Yeah, I felt like the method one was really easy to follow, and then when we did the other part, I mm -hmm. lost my mind. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> the first part, though, I thought wasn't too bad. When he showed us like the method one incomplete, I was like, oh, okay, yeah, that totally makes sense. I get that. I get that. I get that. And then, method two kind of just everybody yeah. I saw I felt like everybody had a wrench thrown at them. Yeah, the method two where it's uh he was moving stuff around and he was adding he said there was like a trick that we'll have to do later where it's like cosine squared x equals one half plus one half cosine two x. And I, mm -hmm. I assume it's some identity, and then it just becomes two the cosine squared x over two. And then we kept getting that square root of two, two to the square root of two answer. Mm -hmm. Whatever, man. I'm I'm just gonna try to get a couple more of these done, like between the next couple of days, and hope that's gonna be good. But um, everybody's asking about the exam. I think, guys, it's gonna be on some of five in chapter seven. I think that's what he said. It's. I, What's the exam gonna be? That's what you want to know. That's that's what the the group's asking. Yeah. Okay. Surprise, surprise. It's gonna be a bunch of integrals. That's exactly <laughs> what I said earlier. I was like, I bet it's probably twelve integrals. Great. <laughs> I'll put one of these problems on the test. No, don't do that. <laughs> oh no, these are easy. Oh man. Okay. Well, hopefully we'll do some more of these tomorrow. And well, now look. So, so here's what I'm talking about. That error bound stuff that I just did. Mm -hmm. As soon as you do a couple of them, you'll see how easy it is. Okay. All I'm gonna, all I want you to do is set up the chain. So. Hold on here. That's 40 fluid ounces of Miller Lite and ice. That's good. <laughs> Miller Lite and ice. <laughs> got to rehydrate. You got to get the water. Got to watch the figure. You got to. Got leg. Got leg day tomorrow. Is uh Miller Lite's the champagne of beers, right? Is that their thing? Is that what it is? I think I Miller was Miller the champagne, or no? It's one of those other ones. Um, is that the Michelo one? Mick, is it Mick Mick I thought it was the Mick, uh, the ones that people are now. No, it's Miller Highlight. Okay, it's yeah. not. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, so here's what I mean. So if I was going to put it on the test, 
I would say, all right, here's a guy that we don't have an antiderivative of. The integral of one over x cubed, okay? So I might say, use, um, use T4 to approximate it. And we're gonna go from zero to one, okay? Okay, so your partition points would be this, Okay, one, two, three, four sub intervals. So T4 is going to be this delta X, which is going to be one fourth divided by two times, then it's going to be plug in the first guy, one over one plus zero over four cubed plus two over one plus one over four cubed plus two over one plus two over four cubed plus two over one plus three over four cubed plus one over one plus four over four cubed. That's what I would wanna see that you know to do the twos, you know to feed the number into the function, that's it. And then maybe a bounding question, okay? But all I want you to do is to show me this chain right here. So you don't want the actual answer, like the number that you got with the count. Oh, hell no, that's gonna be an ugly ass number. I don't want that, you know? I just wanna see if you're, if you're plugging in things correctly. Okay. You know and, what I mean? Yeah, and just so I get this correct, like, and I'm, I apologize because you're probably not going to want to re-explain this, but so I see it's one and it's two, two, two. Why is the final chain one? Because I noticed in the other one was two, four, two, four, two, four. Yeah, Simpson's rule is two, four. Okay, so the reason that it's the twos, we had a bunch of trapezoids here, okay? And we were using, I'm, I'm, I'm writing with the thing up. What are you doing, Tanner? Okay, can you do this in the other room, please? It's not working. So what happens is, is that this stick gets used twice. This stick gets used twice in the area. That's why all of the twos are up here. Oh. Let's see. Here it is. Okay, so here's where it was. You see, this is the area of the first one right here. Okay, now the next trapezoid is gonna come down and do that. That's that guy. Now, do you see I've got F of X one twice? Mm -hmm. That's where it's coming from, okay? The reason that the four came out in Simpson's rule is because of we were, remember that one was different. We solved for an area. Okay. Okay. And uh, yeah, that one, as soon as you understand this stuff a little bit better, you can go back and relook at it. And this, the Simpsons rule is actually pretty damn clever. Um, it's not really what we would use to integrate like that important function, that e to the negative x squared. We'll use techniques in chapter 11 to do stuff with that, okay? So, and again, you know, the test is open book. I mean, are you, I would hope that you would at least try to do the thing, but you know what, with the integrals, I think open book, closed book, it makes no difference. You know, unless I put a problem that the answer is in the back of the book, it's really all about your wits, you know. Yeah. Can can you make those substitutions? Like, you know what I mean? Um, so, Professor, mm -hmm. 
So for the answers, you would just want to see the work or would you like to see the work and the answer and the test? Oh, no, no. All you're going to show me are the answers. Only the answers. Yeah, I'm not kidding myself. Go. I mean, mm -hmm. like you could you could show, you know, copy down exactly what you saw on the internet. I mean, I mean, what's the point of that? Oh, okay. Got it. Thank you. All right. So maybe spend a little bit of time with this, but really what I want you to do more than anything else is integrate, right? Yeah. Okay. All right. So tomorrow we're going to have improper integrals. Oh. So these are integrals that either go off to infinity or maybe the function has a discontinuity somewhere in the interval. They're going to take and, a trillion, huh? And, and we're going like to be like a tangent. It seems like it's a cotangent and tangent going whoop, but then we're going to flip it. Yeah. So anyway, with these improper guys, we'll, we'll get actually to the gamma function. So oh. I'll be able to, that was Euler's uh, extension of the factorial function. Hmm. Uh, I didn't hear any news from school today, so nothing. Um, uh, I will assume I won't be on that campus again for just a year, man. That's just my guess. If I get to go back there before summer 2021, I'll-, I'll Unless you have a lab. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't. I have like, it depends on, I need to talk to a counselor, but however many math courses and then two computer science math courses and that's it which i technically did you guys did that. you guys get the email from campus safety about they caught a guy in decent exposure on campus and arrested him oh yeah i got that like but it was just sent to me by the guy who i'd emailed about a refund for my parking so i was, <laughs> wasn't sure if that was like a public email or what was going on but because it was like from that thread <laughs> yeah so anyways, that was me. Actually, what? I'm just kidding. No, I was, I was like, <laughs> yeah, but, I feel like that's what I want to know fine. is there's no one on campus. <laughs> Who's he flashing? Oh, he's flashing, you know, he's, he's, he's flashing the, the what, security uh, guard. <laughs> you can't find those guys. <laughs> well, he saw him, though. That was the thing. I, <laughs> think, I think he's I think he's flashing a, 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 a lamppost or something or something with a camera. Maybe he's flashing the building. I don't know. I, no, seriously, man. go over there. There's no one. You have a bunch of, here's what you have in the parking lot. You drive in after the construction guys all leave. You generally have one or two dads out there showing, trying to teach their kids how to drive in the parking lot. Are they even allowed? Other than that, nothing. And those security guards are going to, you think they're going to hang out at Lewis? You know, there's two. Yeah. Okay. So where's all the money tied up at OCC? By the NBCC in the new building. I think more towards Lewis. I think the most prized possession of Orange Coast College is a goddamn planetarium. Oh, you're talking about that? Oh, the planetarium. I was like, I, I've which, only walked which in. None of us, second, which none of so. us are allowed to use. Yeah, I was it's like, like run by the foundation. Started. So that's where the security guards are hanging out. So I just think like, a guy that only has two security guards to handle, he sounds like a pretty shitty flasher, you know, like an unsuccessful one. I, I would read those often when like we were back in school and it made a lot more sense because there were people there, but it was kind of a strange trail to get when no one's on campus and you're not allowed to be there. So yeah. it's like, uh, <laughs> hey guys, something bad happened here. I know none of you are there. I just wanted to let you know. <laughs> Do you guys know um, um, Dr. AP, Eddie? Yeah. You ever taken yeah, a class I, from him? I took a Dr. AP class. Many, many years ago when I first started, Eddie, uh, he used to be enormous. Is yeah, this is before. Strong? No, he was kind of, he was big fat. Oh, really? Yeah, he, he got, he had cancer. He's a cancer survivor and he got in a really bad accident. Oh, okay. But before this happened, my office was kind of near Jamie's office and Eddie and Jamie back in those days were best friends and, and, and I'm in Jamie's office and 
Eddie comes running in, freaked out because he was just went in to use the downstairs bathroom in Lewis. And the way that that was, you had a urinal and then yeah. you had the stall. Yeah. And he said he went in to go to the bathroom and he looked down in the in the stall and he saw two sets of feet facing each other. And he freaked out and <laughs> ran out of the bathroom. And I'm like, you got to call campus security. We can't have people going at it in the bathroom. <laughs> yeah, man. He didn't want to call because he didn't want to explain it. That was funny. Man, I bet he is a very nice person to you. But as <laughs> an adult taking his class, I it was all within like my, I had to hold myself back from not dropping that class. Um, and How long ago? I took him one year ago or right before your pre-calc. So your pre-calc was what, spring? Why, do you yeah. think it was hard? Or no, no, sorry, fall. I, I'll be honest with you, man, like, because I have no problem just talking about this. He was a jerk. I mean, he, he constantly called people dumb and not like, a, hey, you're dumb for not knowing this. He would choose people in the class who would submit their work and be like, this is how a fool would attempt to do this problem. And he would do this in front of, I was in a large lecture hall of about 150 people. And I'll just be, you know, I mean, you know me, dude. Like, I was like, I paid it. I, I took, told him this in front of the class. Like, hey, man, like, I'm paying to be in your class. Like, I don't appreciate this at all. So he pulled me outside. And then he had a long talk to me, too, and said if I ever did that again, he kicked me out and talked to the head of the school. But, like, I, I mean, I'll just be honest, man. Like, I just don't care like he could do whatever you know? i mean that's it, surprising it, to hear that because the book on him is that he's just given up yeah i mean that that is I, that's what i've heard too but the way he's chosen to give up from what i've gathered is just like like has he ever talked to you about his cell phone policy no oh dude it's it is insane like i i followed it because he what he does is like if he finds you using your phone even if he's not in the room right Say he's not in the classroom at all, and he walks in the back, so he didn't walk in front, so you can't see him, and he walks by you. Luckily, it never happened to me. There were some girls using their phone. He will stop, and then he will kick them out of the class. This is if the class hasn't started yet or if, you know, anything. If, he, if they didn't even know he was in the classroom, kick them out of the class because it's one of his policies to do that. He'll also, like, drop these papers off. Like, I've heard he's great from a lot of the other teachers there, man, but I – yeah, me and, and Eddie had some big issues. Um, and for a while there, I was about to go way high up the chain. And I realized I'm like, is this worth doing? Like, I don't want to deal with it. And it's not, you know, I'm, I, even though I'm like the oldest person, I feel like none of these kids are going to like stand up for themselves. And I want to stand up for them. It's like, do I really want to start picking a fight with this guy who most of the faculty seems to like? What'd you have him for? Trig? Trig, yeah. I had to take Trig again after 14 years of not taking that. So <laughs> it was, uh, it was interesting. I still got through that class, but it was a real weird class because I went to the final with an A and barely got out of that class with a B. So, um, but yeah, he's, uh, yeah, it was, it was weird. I was, oh, he's a lot different now, two years later. I mean, he's, he just doesn't care anymore, you know? Yeah. I mean, I mean, I've told everybody that I'm, I'm not doing 285 ever again. Yeah. But I mean, if, are you guys going to do it? I got to I got to check what I, I'm assuming Edward. I got to check too. Because I I I'm going to let me know. Yeah. There's another reason for it is my oldest son he might need it. Okay. So that'd be cool man. I told him I I, I just I don't want to do it anymore but anyway. And I real quick though I don't mean to like put down Dr. AP. I don't think being a teacher is easy and I definitely don't think like you know that it's it's fair for the two, uh, students to not give him respect when you know obviously he deserves it but it was just like you'd come to the class sometimes and he'd just yell at the whole class at the beginning and call you dumb for like the first 10 minutes and then like if you answered his questions he'd publicly humiliate you so it, it just got to the point where it's like dude what do you what's going on you know and then he'd come back a week later and cry and say they talked to his wife and that he was sorry for for like at the beginning of class, like he's sorry and he needs to change. And then the next class, it would be the same thing. And I, me and the rest of the class were just like, whoa. So when we met you, that's why we're like, hey, we're sticking with you. And a few of my people from Dr. AP were like, yeah, we're sticking with you through this thing. So I had a professor at UCI, it was Allie Nesson. And 
he was it was uh, taking algebra from him. It's uh, abstract algebra, and there was a big class. They admitted a lot of us that year to, in grad school, and he had asked a question. He's lecturing at the board, and he put something up. He's a, he's uh, Turkish, okay, and he's the guy. You know, he, he, like he would he somehow managed to break open the window in his office that's not supposed to be open <laughs> so he could smoke cigarettes. Nice, you know? man. Yeah, so, and then like there was one day he was walking down the hallway kicking cans and so he's, you, you say, okay, he's a jerk. This guy's a jerk. They kicking cans. Someone had, someone had found a counterexample to his PhD thesis and it just, pissed him the hell off and yeah and we it was just really funny well this one day he's lecturing like kind of like i do and said okay guys like what do you think if one you know if n to the fourth is greater than something how big is n and this one dude in the class he just said something like wait can you repeat that and nesson goes god damn it and he reaches <laughs> back and the, we had chalkboards and you know those long chalkboard eraser ones oh yeah I know what chalk, you're talking about. he takes this chalk thing and chucks it at this dude Whoa. it hits the back wall all chalk flies up you know yeah and he storms out of the classroom yeah. <laughs> we were like wow <laughs> yeah i i'm totally all for like if a teacher like okay good example hey i didn't pay attention to your class and i say why'd you do that? Like, yeah, then it, you can be like, Hey man, you should be paying attention. And you've said that to me and I've done that before. Like, that's a normal thing. I'm totally cool with that. But I just think it's like, Hey, if you're asking people to contribute and then you're yelling at them and publicly humiliating them for contributing, nobody's going to want to contribute in your class. So yeah, it was, uh, it was definitely weird feeling like, you know, especially at that time, because the world was normal and I was paying for these classes and it was like, I just decided to go back to math. It's like, I'm paying money to be in a class of a person who doesn't want me there it, and is publicly like saying like, Hey, <laughs> get out of my class if you don't like me. And um, if you're too dumb to get this, you should uh, stop doing math altogether. And I get that. I get that some people can't, you know, it's difficult. Math is difficult for them, but like, well, Ollie, Ollie Nelson, Nelson, uh, he wasn't asking for any participation. Oh. Yeah. Someone <laughs> just decided to say, can you say that again? And that oh, just, man. He would, when he really start thinking, we had chalkboards, you know? Yeah. And he put yeah. the piece of chalk in his mouth and he'd start chewing it, you know? <laughs> this guy could invert uh, three by three matrices in his head. Oh. It was a sight to see, you know, he would just kind of start going <laughs> and he grunting and groaning the whole time. And, uh, you know, really smart guy, but, uh, he's probably the, the biggest jerk I ever, so, you know, came across. Honestly, man, like I've taken, so I took 130 units at OCC before I went to Cal State Long Beach and then I got a degree there. I probably had at least 36 professors i've only had problems with two ever and dr ap was one and in the music department there was a very difficult teacher that's no longer there um otherwise i think the teaching staff at occ is incredible and at cal state long beach i, I mean there were some unique people but everybody was pretty cool and nice i tell you who else you don't want to piss off who shirley gonzalez Oh, I don't know who she is. She's chemistry. Do not piss her off. Okay. Oh yeah, she's a. She was given it. My buddy TJ was in the room. Okay. She's given a chemistry test, and someone's cell phone goes off, and she stands up. Goes, God damn it! Who's fucking <laughs> using a goddamn fucking cell phone in my? Like, oh man. TJ said she just like you know a little vein coming out right there. You know. Yeah, she was. It's, it's weird because like, I think there's so many good teachers that it's when you see a bad one, it's just like kind of a weird thing to see. Um, and like I said, I heard Dr. AP is brilliant and I've heard a lot of great things from people who had him literally one year before I did. But I think he's like trying to retire. Somebody was explained to me and you know, he's trying to just get out of there. So, well, he's upset because 
he's not happy with our new dean. Okay. And he's never, I mean, I have my problems with her, but now it's like we get along. Yeah. But the other thing, you, Eddie used to be all union guy. Okay. And all the union people turned on him saying, eh, we just don't think we need you anymore and stuff. Oh. So he's just, he's just pissed. You know, he just wants yeah. to retire. I mean, I don't blame him, man. Like, I, he seems like he's a brilliant dude. Like, you know, he wrote his, I had to buy his $100 book. Like, he's very well written for the most part. But uh, yeah, it's, I just, man. I mean, if you, I think uh, Jaeger, who's in this class with me as well, was also in his class. And like, yeah, he could just verify. It was, it was a class where there were girls in our class who would cry almost every class because he normally like gets so confrontational that it was just like, it was palpable, like the fear in the other students. That's why, like I said, I called him out. But like I said, he, he told me he would get me kicked out of the school if I ever did that again. So um, I... I was one week away from first. Nah, he's full of shit. He can't. I, I get I get you, but it was just like, do I really want to pick a fight with this dude? So I just shut up, you know, like I took when I was at UCLA took complex analysis from this guy, Takasaki. Okay. And and you he we're in grad school and he's giving exams every two weeks. You don't, you don't take tests in grad school. You know, you take yeah. one test to qualify an exam, but he's given tests. And and he wouldn't hand them back in class. You had to go to his office and you walk in and he'd ball you out for 15, 20 minutes on how stupid you are. Yeah. And then he would have this weird quality. Like anytime you asked him a question, he would answer it. And then he would, one of the older guys told me, and then he's going to answer something that you're going to ask guaranteed a year from now. And sure enough, you know, I go into his office to pick up my test and the girl bef that was in, in front of me, um, she was part of my little, um, our little crew that, you know, yeah. like you guys have your crew, like we had our little crew and she, she's bawling, crying. And I'm like, oh, this is going to be great. Uh, yeah. But I don't care. So, you know, he just yelled yeah. and screamed at me. And then I asked him a question about something and sure enough, he asked, answered it. And then he answered something that he goes, eventually you're going to think about this. And sure enough, the next year I was thinking about that very thing. Really? Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's bizarre. I this think guy was, he, he actually, have you, have you heard of uh, something called the Taniyama Shimura conjecture? Mm, the second name sounds familiar, but. Have you ever heard of something point. called Fermat's last theorem? You yeah. said that to us. I yeah. yeah. Okay. So the proof of Fermat's last theorem was done by proving something called the Taniyama Shimura conjecture. And Taniyama and Shimura were post-war mathematicians in Japan in the 50s. Takasaki knew both of them. Uh, Taniyama committed, yeah, Taniyama committed suicide. And Shimura, uh, I think he's still alive. He's retired. He shows up on number file every now and then in a lecture. But um, yeah, Takasaki knew those guys. And... Okay. Goro Shimomura or Goro Shimomura, the Japanese mathematician, is that you're talking about? He worked in nebulary yeah. automorphic forms. He's like, I went to Princeton. Oh no, he's dead. He was in Princeton. He died last year. Yeah. And then Taniyama, he was the actual smart one of the two. Oh, I see him. You talked about Taniyama. Yeah, man. So the, the conjecture was what we're going to do in a in, in chapter uh, 10 is we're going to start parameterizing curves. So like, you know, like a circle is not a function, but if you say that X is cosine of T and Y is sine of T, then what you've done is you have um, parameterized that non-function with two functions, okay? So the Taniyama Shimura conjecture says something about if you take a thing called an elliptic curve and you plug a complex variable, you plug complex variables in and you hold one of them constant, the conjecture says that those can always be parameterized by a very specific set of curves called modular forms. And so it was conjectured way back in the 
in the, I think, early 60s. And then Ken Ribe finally put it to bed in 82. And so that was, well, he didn't prove Taniyama Shimura, but he proved Sarah's Epsilon conjecture that linked the Taniyama to Fermat. Oh. So Eduardo, this is a bunch of stuff that eventually, you know, you'll, you'll be reading out. stories about. Tomorrow, probably after, after we end the class, um, for you, mm -hmm. I'm gonna I'm gonna do the gamma function and a few other things that I think you 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 should have sitting around with you. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you can look up the gamma function on your phone, but um, I'm gonna kind of like develop it from what Euler was thinking about. Okay. Okay. And so hey, that'll be tomorrow. Hey, Bobby, do you, man, I wish I could remember this guy. There was a teacher that I had at OCC, and I'm curious if he's still there. Um, math, he taught Math 30. He used to have a ranking system. Does that ring a bell at all? It was like, I think it was Math 30. It was Algebra 1. Um, math 10? Oh, is that Math 10? <laughs> yeah, I was lazy, and I had taken a trig my junior year of high school and took math off my senior year. So I went and just took the easy. Remember how they used to test you to go to OCC? And one was like a trig test and one was an algebra test. So I just yeah. took the algebra test and aced that one. So do you remember what they look like or? I know he's an Asian dude and he's really cool. And I loved him because he ranked our class. Oh man. And that class was so. <laughs> an older guy? Uh, yeah, yeah. He was probably, this was, you know, 2006. He was probably at least in his late fifties, maybe sixties at the time. Oh yeah. That guy's Robert Chen. I love that guy, dude. He was so cool. He's not there anymore, is he? No, I haven't, we haven't seen him in a while. Oh, Robert Chan, there he is. Yeah, our yeah. instructor. Yeah, I was just like looking on the faculty thing because I just loved it because he ranked us, and because it was math 10, I had the number one ranking in class, and it was like, oh, man, it was a very fun course for me. But The, the Japanese style, that's how they, they grade their students. They'll, they'll put oh, them on cool. a little bulletin board. You're right, one, two, three, and then just go down the board. That's actually how they do med school stuff too. A lot of my yeah. grades do their post back. They don't actually do grades because everybody would get an A. So they just give a ranking. So everybody's like fighting for like the top rank. It's like, stu I, in my opinion, it's kind of dumb because it essentially just hits everybody against each other. But well, I guess that's, that's how the real is. world is. Uh, I, mean, no, I know, I know. Really that's how the real world is. I just. Andy sent out an, uh, an article from the New York Times talking about, okay, are grades even worth it anymore? I mean, you know, yeah, they don't really matter too much, but. So, I, I know, know I read part of it, but it's just, you know, Andy doing his thing. It, it, the, my idea, I think the, the, the way the Japanese, the Chinese, and even India does it, where you get ranked or you rank, it puts you in a competition against yeah. your classmates, is the better way of teaching because, I mean, it self-motivates you to be better than the kid you but, hate. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's a couple problems I have with it. One is you're not motivated if, if you're at the bottom. If you're at the bottom, you've given up. Um, more likely than not, unless it's really close. And then two, what if you're in like the top class and then you're against each other, which is good in some parts, but what if there's an extremely lower class and that class, the top of that class, if they can get a job with the top of the top class, like you have to do a ranking of everybody at the school. You know yeah, what I mean? Oh, yeah. And that's what, yeah, uh, that is class. exactly how it is, but they divide it into classes and they put a bunch of smart people in one class and a bunch of dumb people in another class. And then even though it's the same kind of thing, it's like they're teaching way different things for the smart people and way different for the dumb people. So how do you and grade this mid class? Yeah, how do you grade those people then? If it's like, oh, hey, they're learning. They all write the same test. It's all based on, like, there's a test which is given for to the whole country. It's like the SATs, but you only get it once a year. Okay. So, yeah, it's, for the yeah, you get lag. You get ranked around, like, in the 10,000s and the 100,000s. Um, so, yeah, <laughs> if you get your number as 100,000, like, you're screwed. <laughs> you don't get into a college. <laughs> yeah, I liked it my high so school because there was only seventy people and I was ranked out of them, and it was life was easy. So I was like, yeah, you do start dealing when you guys when you guys go to grad school, you'll deal with the per the percentiles, which is uh, so you take the GRE test, and 
you might have to take the subject test. But what I was told by Kimberly, she was like the graduate coordinator at UC Irvine. I scored like in the 64th percentile on the math subject test. Okay. I thought, well, oh, God, I got a D, you know. That's but I remember, really difficult to get. Well, well, what she told me was, no, that's pretty good. She said, you know, the, the top Americans get like in the 70s. But you don't get anybody in the 80s until you start looking at Eastern Europeans. Yeah. And then what about the 90s? And she said, oh, those are all mainland China. Yeah. So, so what happens is in Eastern Europe and in mainland China, I, I, I would bet you that Stan did this. What they do is they get a PhD in their home country, and then they come here mm. to get a real one. Another one? Well, I mean, and so they're competing against. So here I was, 23 years old, applying to go to graduate school, and you know, I'm I've had five years of undergrad of the double major, and to get into UC whatever grad school, I'm competing with this guy from mainland China who basically already has a PhD. Yeah, he's going to kick my ass on the GRE. He knows a lot more than me. So. Yeah. That's but, the system. That's the system that some of you are going to have to kind of fight a little bit later. If you yeah. want to go to med school, like, well, I don't think anybody here is allowed to go to Johns Hopkins. You have to. Mm -hmm. I think your mom has to be a senator, and <laughs> dad has to be. But but for like uh, UCLA medical, you know how hard it is to get into that medical school. I mean, and again, you're competing with people that already have medical degrees from China. Yeah, you but, know, and Eastern Europe and, you know, the countries that education isn't the weakest link system. It's more like you get to eighth grade. If you can't do this, OK, you go dig a ditch. Yeah. And then you get to 10th grade. OK, you can't do this. So you go drive a forklift. So the one thing they do that's both good and bad is they they don't allow they only allow so many people from each country to join, like to go to those schools. You know what I mean? So you are competing with them to some extent. But in reality, they're competing with each other for like, there's probably a hundred of them and four spots for them to come over because like, okay, so two of my buddies. Uh, I don't know about that, man, because they're I mean, paying a whole lot more money than anybody they else because they're foreign students. That's the key. So I don't, I don't think they can take that many people though. Cause my, okay. So my two buddies, uh, they're brothers. They both got to um, Mayo. They got um, to like the interview portion of Mayo. But they're both uh, Egyptian and Mexican, right? But Mayo can only accept so many Egyptian people and so many Mexican people, and they can only accept 12 people total. So even though they both got like some of the highest MCAT grades, they had to take his brother because he worked for NASA at 14 versus my buddy, who even though he was at like the top level, it was like, hey, you can only take this. So it's like a weird thing. I definitely agree that when you're dealing with people from other countries, it's, it's, it's crazy. But I, if, I, if I'm correct, and I don't know, because otherwise I think every single school would just be foreign students and no nationals because they make so much money off them. I don't even think they would, would deal with us poor people. Yeah, I think there is a limit in the public school too. Right? Yeah, I think so like public UCI, universities, yeah, they, can't, exactly. they can't take a certain amount as far as yeah. I know. Because mm -hmm. it's just, yeah, you're right, Bobby. There would be nobody from here. It would just be, we would all be going to different <laughs> countries flying across. And, um, I feel yeah. like if, if, if that were the case, man, we would all be stuck digging ditches. Well, yeah, you know, it's, because, education I mean, is so they, let's, let's, Our education here in, in the US is not what it is in other countries. I don't know why they would even have to fly. They have their PhDs in their country. Yeah, well, right? the jobs pay way and less. And their jo jobs would be less over there because yeah. it's so acclaimed. But getting it here would basically mean nothing because here we're dumber than dirt, right? But I mean, the job is ours here worth more than the ones over there. Well, depending on school you went to internationally. Here's what pissed me off. There was a problem. So we have an adjunct, Philip Rosut. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. um, he was a postdoc when I was a grad student at UCI. Okay. He's pretty old. And on one of the qualifying exams, one of the, on the real analysis problem that I missed, mm -hmm. it had something to do with this concept you'll learn later called, okay, you have continuity, and then there's something else called 
absolutely continuous. It means it's even more continuous. Okay. So I missed that problem. And, and, you know, I asked Philip, who's a postdoc to do it, like, you know, cause this is kind of his area and he kind of just scribbled it out real quick. And he goes, well, you know, after you've been working with this stuff for about three years, you know, and I thought, okay, that's not fair, <laughs> you know, <laughs> because these people I'm, like Barack from Turkey who hated Ali Nesson. So we had these two Baracks. They're both from Turkey. We had long hair Barack and short hair Barack. <laughs> and short hair Barack, he was a practicing hardcore Muslim. You know, he'd face Mecca however many times a day. Long hair Barack, he is a party animal. Yeah, you know? oh, okay. And crazy Barack, they Barack, call them. They're all from, they're all from uh, Turkey. And Dr. Nesson's dad was this very controversial figure in Turkey that said, okay, us living by these, uh, these uh, Islamic laws, it's, it's retarding the development of our country. We need to stop. And so he's like this hated guy. Oh, wow. And this cool. is Nesson's dad. And so long hair, uh, long hair Barack, he doesn't care. Short hair Barack, he was furious with him. He's like, I'm not taking a class with that guy. I'm like, That's, it's not even him, it's his dad. Yeah. And so. Well, uh, Anyways, what, I think I should probably log out of this Zoom meeting here. Okay, real quick. One last thing, though, is yeah. that they do um, one thing just to add, because when I was living over in China, the one thing that we do really well in education here is like the creativity aspect that is not pushed at all in China or a lot of Asia. You're expected to copy. So you may have a billion geniuses, but there's not actually a lot of new things coming out of those countries in terms of products and goods. That's why their cars are still- The like government them. limits them in creativity. <laughs> yeah, it's well, I mean, their, their focus is on like, you know, spitting back. Uh, yeah. Reiterating. Thank you, Monica. Yeah. Sorry. I just wanted to throw that out. Thanks, Bob. <laughs> okay, guys. We'll see you tomorrow. Yeah, and, I'll be late. Uh, but I'll, I'll see you tomorrow. We'll be doing improper integrals, and then Eduardo at the end for you. Where we'll do the, um, we're going to do the gamma function. That for anyone else who wants. All right. All right stay classy. There you go. Bye.